You all hear me all right? That's good. All right, awesome. So with this, I'll begin my bird courtship St. Valentine's Day special lecture. This is one of my favorite topics of all time because it includes a lot of really fascinating things. And that includes sexual selection, which is one of my favorite topics, and also the role of birds in human romance. The interesting thing about this topic is that we are all aware of bird courtship. Bird courtship is, it, it's, it seems like a very particular subject, like something that people don't talk about very much, and yet it comes up. Yet we are, as a public, as a general public, all aware that birds court, they court actively and in a showy way. And because birds are everywhere and they do this so conspicuously, this really colors our view of the world, not only in nature, but also of ourselves, because we see ourselves in birds. And we see ourselves when we see birds courting. And this has inspired more study of birds and also the study of ourselves. This is, these are uh, three photos that I've overlaid together of two ravens that I saw on the roof of my local community college. And they are attending to each other. They are showing each other this affection that you can see. If, if they were people, you would say that they were making out. <laughs> and so to see this is really moving to us as, as it should be moving to anyone to see two birds kind of courting together in something that seems very human. And yet we see that it is far more universal than that. Um, I wanted to go into uh, some of the most amazing displays that I know of and how I got interested in this. This is a photo of a great bustard, which is a very large bird that lives in Europe. And if you go to the fields of Spain, especially in spring, you'll see this, you'll see this kind of a, it's pretty big, but otherwise kind of regular looking bird standing out there in the middle of a field. It's got these tiger stripes on it. And you'll, maybe you'll turn away for a second, but if you turn, turn back in a minute and see what it's doing, you won't see a bird anymore. You'll see a blob of foam that's just kind of transforming out there in the field, just moving all its white feathers to turn from a brown bird into this blob, to this ball of foam. This is, this is a very intense experience for a person to see. And so you can imagine what a female bustard staying out there in the field as well may be looking at. Um, I wanted to, to show you my very favorite bird, the King of Saxony Bird of Paradise and its display. So I've attached this video here that I'll be playing in a second. Um, and you can see it has these two long feathers on either side of its head. Um, and it's able to move these independently. And it'll sit out there on the branch and it'll call with this weird sound that it has. It can move both of these feathers. And it produces a sound like radio static. And then it does this hopping motion up and down on a branch to attract females' attention. And it comes to this amazing climax of sound. <laughs> and so it is because of these videos from Cornell that I became so interested in, in how, how did this happen? How did we get, um, hold on, let's, let's try and, and move on to the, to the next slide. How, how did we get this, this amazing variation? Let, let's, let's try to, hold on a second. Let's see if we can move on to the next slide. There we go. All right. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the requirements of courtship. Uh, one of them is sexual maturity. And obviously because, you know, if a bird's body isn't ready to reproduce, then it cannot reproduce and it cannot follow through with courtship. And lifespan does make a difference. We see a, a strong correlation of lifespan with the age of sexual maturity. Um, so when you're looking at um, when when you're looking at different aged birds, so for example, if you take warblers, which don't live a very long time, you might be shocked to to think about how they start breeding only in the second year of their lives, right? That sounds that sounds kind of crazy. However, you also have to consider that warblers live only about four or five years. And if you compare that to people, 
that's kind of like, if, if we say that the average lifespan, I, I may be off on this, is about 60 or 70. That's a pretty good lifespan. That would be like a person uh, reproducing at about 30 years of age, which certainly seems very reasonable because that's not very far off from how we do that, at least here. Um, and then in comparison, if you take an albatross, which can and do live up to 60 years, uh, they start breeding and about the 15th year of their lives. And so there's a little bit earlier than that, but they take several years to mature. This is also the case for the blue bowerbird, which you can see in these photos. You can see this, uh, this male on the right photo discerning, a, kind of taking a, a look at this, this younger male who is green. He's not fully mature yet. He's got this green coloration. And so he kind of looks like a female blue bowerbird, except he's got this bright blue iris is how you can tell still a male. And uh, you can see that this young male, he's collecting blue things, which is the favorite activity of the blue bowerbird. And they do this in order to put all these blue things, which nowadays tend to include a lot of plastic things, like, uh, as you can see, bottle caps. Um, but in the past, they will have collected blue feathers and anything else with a sheen that, that, is, uh, that is attractive to them. And this young bowerbird is, you know, he's, he's not sexually mature yet, but he's collecting blue things and he's practicing building a bower. And I'll explain to you what a bower is and why the bowerbirds are called this way. A bower is a display area that these bowerbirds set up. And it is a, in, these, in the case of this species, because different species of bowerbirds set up different kinds of bowers, they set up all these sticks and a parallel, two parallel pillars, you know, apart from each other. And in the center, there's a gap and there's more sticks on the ground. And then all around them on the ground, they will put blue things. And this is to please the eye of the female and to create a kind of a spectacle um, because the male then, when a the female has come to the bower and is checking out, ooh, look at all these, look at all these blue things lying on the ground and this, this weird structure made out of sticks that is clearly not not natural, not made by the elements, then the male bowerbird will hop down to his bower, he'll kind of strut around in his bower, and he'll show off, he'll, he'll pick up, hey, look at this blue thing, I, I got this blue thing, look at this bower that I made, you know, and then if he gets lucky, then they'll mate because she's pleased with him. Um, but you can see also that the young bowerbird builds bowers. He's clearly not reproducing, but he's practicing, and in fact, the young bowerbirds, in the case of the blue bowerbird, will sometimes collaborate. And you'll have kind of this whole gang of teenaged blue bowerbirds that are not sexually mature yet, but that are building bowers together. And, uh, and the funny thing about this photo down here that I have is that the, the adult male is looking at the handiwork of this, this young male bowerbird who is clearly not very good at building bowers yet because all the sticks are lying on the ground. All right, the next requirement uh, is availability because if a bird is ready to breed but there's nobody to breed with, then you can't breed. So um, birds have to get together. And in th this case, you might recognize these birds. These are the greater sage grouse. Um, and you can see these two males with these big spiky tails on the right and these big inflated neck pouches with these white, stiff feathers prickling out from them. And they're both taking a moment not to compete with each other physically, but rather to stand together and try to get the attention of this female who is giving them both a really nonchalant look um, on the side. And what these birds are doing is they're lecking. They have all gathered together in one spot in a place called a lek, because in the case of the greater sa sage uh, grouse, you'll otherwise, any other time of year, you'll find them spread out over the vast plains of the Midwest. Um, and you'll, you'll, you'll have all this, this, uh, this sage and it looks like there's nothing. There's a few birds and there's not really a way for these, these merits, in the case, the, the aesthetic beauty of the male grouse to be shown altogether. And this is very interesting because you can see that these birds are gathering 
whether consciously or not, to, to compare each other with themselves. And then for the females to choose who she wants to mate with. It's a big party for the purpose of breeding. That, that's what a lek is. And availability will differ um, between the different kind of lifestyles you have in birds. So nomadic birds, which are somewhat similar to the sage grouse. Um, let, let's explain first that nomadic means that you don't have a fixed home. You're not staying in one spot. You are a resident over a large area, such as a desert, or for example, a swath of the Pacific Ocean. Um, but your food source is random, and that's why you're nomadic. You're, and you're nomadic because you're following this food source, like fish, like berries, which come in and out of season, in the case of the sage grouse. Um, and you are getting together in groups because this way you share information. And when you share information, you have a higher chance of survival altogether, because these birds are stronger altogether rather than apart in this unpredictable place like the desert, like the ocean. And so in the nomadic case, you tend to have things like lex, where they will gather all together and they'll have a big show. In migratory birds, there is sort of a, an, also an agreement on where to meet, but it simply means that some part of the year you'll be somewhere and another part of the year you'll be somewhere else, depending on what is more comfortable for you. And so that just means that the males and the females have to migrate together or at least be in agreement about where they're going to go. And after that, it's decided in much the same way as a resident bird would decide where there is a bird claiming a stake to a territory or at least proclaiming its merits um, and then other birds deciding whether or not they want to mate with that bird. And especially in, in what happens with migratory birds, you have something very important happening is this the, the staking of territory. So we've got, we've got sexual maturity, we've got availability, and now you need to stake a territory. You need to put out this fence and say, I've got this place. I, that means I can, you know, I can breed, I can make a nest, and you should check out, you know, you should check out my backyard. You know, what's, what's my backyard looking like? And in this case, in this photo, you can see this wren that's perched up in this very typical position on a snag and it's singing its song, which by the way, is incredibly loud um, for such a small bird. And it's advertising. And in the springtime, migratory birds will, will have the males arrive a week or two, say usually a week and a half before the females do to the same spot. So say you're a warbler migrating up to the boreal forest of Canada. The males are gonna get there first. And the females come a little bit later. Why is this? We are not certain, but we think that it is because all the territory gets sorted out before the females arrive. Because the females, their part most of the time is to choose a mate and then settle down with him. It is the male's job to have an area where they can build a suitable nest together and to advertise that area. And so um, in migratory birds, the male will arrive earlier and then they will, you know, they'll settle their disputes some will get the best territories, some will get not so good territories. And then when the females come along, the males are not paying attention to each other anymore because they've settled that already. They're, they're like, they're, they just sing in the morning to say, I'm still here, I'm still alive. Um, but mostly they're paying attention to the females that are now beginning to arrive. So now the stage is set. We have sexual maturity, we have availability, we have places for a nest to be, Birds are all together and now they need to talk to each other. So this is very important. You can see in, in this picture, there is a yellow warbler and this beautiful spring plumage. And he's probably paused right in the middle of a song to look at the photographer. He's perched up on a tree in the middle of the rain. And the reason why he's doing this out in the open is probably to give a song. And if it was in the morning to say, I'm still here, what, what does this mean to the birds that are listening to another male? It means, oh dang, that male is still in that, that really nice habitat. I, I, I'm not gonna go fight him for it. We're, you know, the, the status quo remains the status quo. Um, or if he's new, he's saying, hey, come fight me. I'm gonna be in this new territory. Um, whoever, you know, another male can come challenge me now. And to the female, he is showing off his colors 
he's showing off his song, he's showing off how he's practiced it, how well he knows it, how much stamina he has in order to have survived the night and the rain and be standing up there in the cold singing his song. Now, something interesting that we have in birds is the standardizing of attractive traits. We see this in people a little bit as well. And the analogy perhaps is best given by some shared activities. Let's say, let's say opera. If, you know, th this, this is cost effective for, for two reasons. The first being that you use less, less uh, effort to give the same amount of information. So if, if people chose their mates based on how good op opera singers men were, for example, uh, to draw an analogy with birds, then when a guy is out there singing like a bird does, not only is he showing how good he is to a female, the woman, but also his stamina off to another guy and they're comparing each other. There's male-male competition going on. And male-male competition can be deadly. And so here we run into another problem that standardizing attractive traits fixes uh, and makes more cost effective. Because if you had birds that were not in agreement, which does happen by the way, that are not in agreement about what trait is standardly attractive and whether one has more of something than the other does, then you would get a lot of fights that would be unresolved. And an unresolved fight, which is to say a fight in which their birds cannot end up agreeing with each other can mean death for one of them um, and a lot of cost for the other that ended up killing the other one. So what you do when you standardize an attractive trait is you take a trait that exists in a bird and you decide whether more or less of it is better um, or rather the female is deciding this. Um, and the males are also aware of this. So in the case of the house sparrow here, um, I took this photo, I think it was in, in Central Park. Um, there's a bunch of house sparrows eating rice all together. And I've got this photo of this male and you can see this black bib that it has on its throat, this black marking. And he's really a dapper male. He's got this fine gray color here, this reddish brown um, going to white and, he, and, and this black in the face and the breast. And what people have found out is that this black is an indicator of male quality. And part of what this means is that male house sparrows during the breeding season are looking at each other and they're sizing each other up. And if there needs to be a fight, if there's a disagreement um, and they don't wanna waste energy, then they can simply look at each other and say, well, that guy looks like he's gonna beat me up and looks like he's gonna be a dominant male because he has more black on his chest than I do. And this black on the chest does in fact correlate with having more stamina, with having more fitness. And these birds are aware of that. So if there are two birds that are fighting over food, two or, or females, um, and they have these same characteristics, they can look at each other and they can think, hey, well, you don't look as cool as I do. Well, oh, that guy looks, looks cooler than I do. I, I better not fight him. I better use some other strategy rather than um, risk getting killed or badly hurt. And in this way, they both save energy and go to a more efficient strategy of breeding. And so you start getting these interesting things that we all know there's a really stunning variety of of markings in birds. And in this case, you can see this is up close, the king vulture. You have this staring white eye in the middle and it's kind of a black fuzz. You would almost say it's hair, but it's not because no bird has hair. They only have modified feathers. Um, this can include eyelashes even sometimes. So you've got these modified feathers on the face. You've got these weird looking kind of brown wrinkles on the side and then this this snood that's almost like a turkey's snood, this brightly colored skin hanging over the beak, which is bicolored in this kind of a Halloween theme, which the whole bird looks like really. Um, so you start getting these, these bright things and you're wondering to yourself, so are the males looking at this? You know, are they, 
are they looking at each other? How can they size up all these different factors? In this case, we're looking at the Wilson's bird of paradise, which just looks bizarre. It, it's bald, it's got this bald blue head, this bright yellow back of the neck, which then turns into this red dorsum and these two springs, it looks like springs just coming out the back end. And if you were to see it from below, you would see these, these kind of um, blackish, like a dark blackish, almost like an ochre color, which it can flip in an instant to produce an emerald kind of a shield, which is spectacular, but it's so, it's, it's weird, right? How did this happen? And how, how do these things happen? That we, we come to the, the great Argus pheasant on the left, which in the, is in the middle of its display with each of these feathers that are several feet long protruding outwards in this, this amazing fan. And you can see these, these eyes, the ocelli, you would say, which comes from directly from Italian or Latin for eye, that from the female's perspective, which you can see a little bit in the foreground of this photo, um, from the female's perspective, these feathers will be coming out at you kind of like a, a tilted over amphitheater. Um, they'll be coming out at you and you can see that, that by some miracle of science, these, each of these eyes grows larger as it goes outward in the feather. Um, and they go from about half, of an inch, half an inch wide at the beginning of the feather to about an inch and a half at the end. And what this means is that if you are the female and you see this male displaying at you with this huge fan that suddenly becomes your world, you have these, these eyes with the counter shading underneath so that they look like golden balls that seem to float in the air and as you go farther up, they do not become smaller because of uh, the force effect view that these feathers have. As they come at you and the balls get larger physically out towards the end, they will look the same size to you. And so what the female is experiencing is this tapestry that has just opened up and these, these floating golden spheres that seem to be hovering all around her and all in the, in the middle of all of that, by the way, is the male with his bright blue face and his eye kind of coyly hidden, hiding, hiding his beak under, under his wrist and looking at her and gauging what she is thinking and what, what she is feeling as he is producing this display. And then on the right, you have the peacock, which is very famous. Um, and similarly, it has this, this train of feathers. They're exquisite. Uh, and these feathers don't even, you know, you can see that the barbules are more, more hair-like and they're separate. So these are even worse than the great Argus pheasant feathers at having insulation and at being useful for anything other than physical attraction. So if we're dealing with natural selection alone, these birds should not exist. These birds are insane. The peacock, and the Argus pheasant, and many other birds in many ways should, should not exist, sh are, are like fairy birds. They are like drawings of the imagination that if we lived in a world with only natural selection, it would be wishful thinking to see such a spectacular thing. And so we'll, we'll turn to Charles Darwin for a moment. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about natural selection. So a quick, quick introduction to natural selection, by the way, um, is that, well, natural selection, it deals with a lot of forces in evolution, but it is one of the most important discoveries um, in biology, or perhaps not a discovery so much as a realization as so much of science is. Um, and Darwin, when he was, he was working with birds and with animals and seeing a, the stunning variety that he saw while aboard the HMS Beagle. Um, and when he came home and he had all these collections, he saw, he saw this, this stunning variety of creatures and he was thinking about how does this arise? And he eventually said, well, nature is actually selecting itself because the things that do not work, that are created whether by accident or miracle, and we, we do not understand how they work yet. Now we know how DNA works, but he didn't know that then. Um, 
we understood that pedigrees and the way that things bred had an effect on the children that would come later, on the generations that would come later. Um, and Darwin was aware that something was happening, that nature was selecting itself in order to be ever better at adapting to its environment. And so he writes, as for myself, I am fully convinced that there does exist in nature a means of selection, always in action, and of which the perfection cannot be exaggerated. And these are bold words for our scientists. These are wonderful words. And he was right. But he was trying to deal with natural selection by itself. And so he started coming up on a problem. Most famously, the problem of the feather in the peacock's tail, this, this bird that should not exist. He said in a letter to Asa Gray, a fellow scientist, the sight of a feather in a peacock's tail, whenever I gaze at it, makes me sick. And why did that make him sick? It drove him crazy because he could not explain it. Because he thought he had come up with natural selection, this wonderful theory that is constantly proving itself that we can actually see ourselves in motion, right? And like any scientist, he wants to have a theory. He wants to have come upon a great theory that explains everything. Many scientists want this. It is, it is a supreme goal in science. And he was plagued by the peacock because he would see it and he, he knew in his heart, his theory could not explain the peacock, right? And at one point, you know, he, he was having a lot of debates with his fellow scientist, uh, Wallace, who was a younger guy who came upon the idea of natural selection at about the same time. And actually there was a, there was a very humorous amount of a kind of writing back and forth saying, what, 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 what did you say you're thinking? Because Darwin wasn't, Darwin wasn't publishing this stuff. He knew that there would be a problem with how people viewed religion and placing people closer to animals than to God would be a big problem for Victorian England, right? Um, so he was not telling anybody about this because he himself knew it was a big and a kind of a crazy idea. And Wallace wrote to him first saying, hey, I, I've got this interesting idea. And, and Darwin's like, oh my God, do you do really? Please tell me more about this. And through this correspondence, he really started writing fast. Um, and it is, that's why we really, we know more about Darwin than we know about Wallace. And I think that both of them have equal merit, except that Darwin at one point was able to write about the very beginnings of what we call sexual selection, right? Um, Wallace did not. Wallace was saying that he, he thought that natural selection could explain, he, he thought that natural selection could explain the Argus and the peacock, right? And Darwin knew that it could not. And this was immensely dissatisfying to him. And yet he was able to admit this and he was able to say, there's something that I'm missing here. And I think there's, there's some other force that is at play in these birds that I do not understand, right? And at one point he was able to write that he believed that there is actually such a thing as aesthetic adaptive mate choice, which is to say that these things we see here are not caused by the whim or the trimmings of nature and natural selection, but by the eye of the female who's standing right there in front, looking at the male and making this choice, choosing whether she will carry on his genes or not. And this has an immense amount of power. Before people were talking about, well, the males are looking at each other and there's male-male competition, right? Um, and then it was sort of assumed that, that when the males had decided what the competition was and who had won, that they would mate with whatever female that they wanted, that they'd been buying the attention uh, for. But it is in fact the female that chooses in many birds, right? And this is immensely powerful. And we have, we have now some explanations for why we get these crazy phenomena, not just of the great Argus pheasant, not just of the peacock, but in many of the birds that we see around us, these things that would be difficult to explain just using natural selection. We can explain them with sexual selection and say, well, in fact, 
not only not only should we change the meaning of of phrase natural selection a bit and say it is not it is not and let me make this clear it is not survival of the fittest it is the survival of what works and this is very important to understand when when thinking about evolution so let's let's put these two down natural selection as the survival of whatever works and the death of what doesn't not the survival of the fittest and the very best we are not we are not uh striving toward a very last like we're not striving toward an end game bird that is the most perfect peacock or the most perfect argus pheasant we are seeing the survival of the argus pheasants that are good enough to survive and the peacocks that are good enough to survive and then the second part sexual se selection we are seeing the survival and the propagation of the genes of the peacock and the argus pheasant that are good enough to survive and then to reproduce right that, that is sexual selection and people have tried to uh and like wallace to try to umbrella sexual selection under natural selection and say well they're they're really not that different sexual selection is just a subset of the same thing but we know now that we are not able to do that because there are cases in which sexual selection is an opposing force, famously as with the peacock. Darwin was looking at the peacock and they were seeing this ridiculously long, shiny train of feathers. They were seeing how much work it must take to clean those, to carry those around, and the cost of, of you know, being a male peacock that you could be caught by the pob cat stepping simply on your train. And you have the difficulty flying, and it's it's so much trouble. What is worth that trouble? Is what was bothering Darwin. And what what Darwin was seeing is that natural selection is supposed to shorten the peacock's tail, is supposed to make things easier for the peacock to survive. And this this train is not doing that. The, the, and that is because you have the opposing force of sexual selection that says trains should be longer just because a female peacock who kind of ironically wears the pants in terms of how genes get to be propagated is discerning and choosing perhaps arbitrarily and on a whim whether or not she likes the, the peacock's tail longer or shorter right and so because they are not always but many times opposing forces we know that sexual selection has to be separate from natural selection um, I wanted to talk about a very interesting case uh, happening with blue mannequins, and this probably happens with several of the birds. I've got a gif here um, where you can see this female, this kind of drab green female fitting perfectly in with the leaves. She's sitting up there on the left, and there, there are, well, it's difficult to see with the gif, but there are not one, but four males competing for her attention, or at least that's what it looks like but they are not actually competing, they are cooperating. And this is a fascinating case where uh, we, we now know that the elder male blue mannequins have had more experience dancing um, and showing up for a female because they have been in troops before like this. The other males are gonna be younger. They will be inexperienced. They'll have their turn kind of flapping in front of her for a second. And then they'll go to the back of the line and they'll come up in front again. And this will be repeated. But if the female does choose to, to, to mate with, with the bird, it's because not only she's saying, I like how this, this troop performed, she's only mating with the older male, the, the kind of the lead of, of this troop. And this is a very interesting system because one would think that if you're a younger male, could say, why would I go dance in some other older males uh, kind of group if I don't get any benefit out of it? But the thing is they do get a benefit because they get this experience and later on, they will gather their own younger males in this dancing troupe and be able to dance for other females. And younger males, in fact, sometimes will be a part of many of these groups at once. Um, and kind of throughout the course of the day, they'll they'll take part in some, and they'll then they'll go dance in another, and in that way they are gaining this experience. It's almost like a practice. And I'm not sure that we fully still understand how much of a benefit 
uh, these mannequins get uh, from from this. Why why they do this? There is they clearly gain experience, but why have mannequins in particular uh, chosen to cooperate? Right. The, this is still this is still in study. Something else that I wanted to mention while we're still on the subject of mannequins is that um, we see these amazing displays, right? We see, we see these dances that have become standardized, which is, this is, this is really amazing that we can have, you know, a father bird that fathers some kids and then those kids go on and dance the same dance that he did, or almost the same, right? Depending on sexual selection and natural selection working together in evolution. And we are in fact able to trace lineages of different birds and study taxonomy or where to place different birds in terms of how they are related to each other based on their dances. Because you can actually follow the similarity of their dances um, through, you know, through taxonomy and say, well, this dance is actually quite different from that other dance in that other species. But this species and this species have very similar dances. And that can in fact give us a clue into, uh, into how related they are. And so we see how closely tied these amazing displays are uh, to evolution and to sexual selection. Um, I, I wanted to say that different breeding strategies uh, require different courtships, right? So uh, we'll talk about the basic forms. We have polygyny, um, which comes from, it, it means poly is many and ginny is female um, or gin is female. And this happens, this happens in a lot of birds, but most family this happens in grouse where you'll have one male with many females, right? Polygen, one male with many females um, and they will, they will reproduce, you know, having mostly the genes of this one male. And in ostriches, which are another very interesting case and are a desert bird, you'll have one male with a really large amount of females that he's fertilizing and he actually tends to be the one that sits on the nest. And so he'll sit down on this nest of like 25 eggs. And so it's, that, that is very funny to see. The other case, which is significantly more rare is polyandry, polymeny andry or andros man. And this happens in phalaropes, which is, uh, this is a seabird that you could see in the back there in the photo and in cardinals. So you, you can have, you, you have this interesting, uh, this interesting strategy right in your backyard if you, if you see cardinals, as Denson was mentioning earlier, um, where the females, you know, in, in the case of the phalaropes, it is the female that is more brightly colored than the male. And she performs what we would normally think of in nature as most of the male's work, which is getting food and uh, building the nest rather than sitting on it. Even though she lays the eggs, it is generally the male that sits on it because he is less brightly colored. Um, the cardinal is an interesting case because the male is much brighter than the female is. And yet uh, one female will mate with many males. And this seems to be kind of a general strategy in cardinals. And then we have monogamy, um, which I will say is not necessarily strict or long-term um, in the way that we might think about it with people but many birds are monogamous at least for a season or a year. Um, and I wanted to show you this slide in particular, continuing with sexual selection, this, uh, this barn swallow showing off this tail that surely it helps it to, uh, to maneuver a little bit in the air. Um, but females, we know now female barn swallows Look at these males and they choose the males based on how symmetrical and how long their tails are. Um, so if a male manages to molt all his feathers properly in a way that they're all the same length at the same time and takes good care of them, then the female will also take that as a sign of being able to provide for her. And he, if he provides for himself, he can provide for her. Right? Um, so on the topic of these, these amazing displays, I wanted to, to explain the concept of behavior ritualization as a stepping stone. So you have these dances, right? And I have for the longest time been wondering, how on earth do you get to a dance like that? It, it's a dance, people dance, right? It, that seems not possible. 
for a bird to do it. And, and all these birds can do it, right? Many birds of paradise and, and many other passerines can dance amazingly. In this case, in this photo here, I'm, I'm showing these two cranes, probably in Hokkaido, Japan, um, where they're calling and they're stepping together. And ritualization is a concept that was brought up by Huxley, um, which has become super important because it is explaining these dances as a set of small steps that have been all added together. So rather than this incredible kind of a, uh, what's it called, an impromptu or a solo being invented, you actually can break up a dance into a series of steps that have been standardized and ritualized. And ritualization also works in terms of basically any behavior can be uh, ritualized. And I, I wanted to, to show, show this photo of a, a cardinal scratching because even scratching can be ritualized. So birds will perform displays where they scratch, but they don't really need to. They will scratch three times and then they'll preen this feather and they'll look at the female, scratch three times and preen again, and look at the female, right? Um, and there are, there are dances where it is very obviously a result of a ritualization of a more mundane action like scratching, like preening, like looking busy, but it has been standardized and it is very clearly not useful because it is, it is not useful to scratch for the scratching, it is actually for the attention of the female, right? Um, these are also placed sometimes as displacement behaviors, in particular scratching, preening, and the appearance of looking busy because there are cases where two birds that are getting together don't actually know whether the other is a male or female, um, as far as we know, because they are colored exactly the same. They tend to be a similar size, uh, especially in, in passerines. And if you're a male and you're getting closer to another male um, because you think, or, or to another bird because you think it might be a female, but it turns out to be a male, you are risking, you know, being beaten up, right? And so males that are approaching a bird that they think is a female will exhibit these scratching and preening and looking busy behaviors as well as appeasement behaviors because it shows that they are not violent, that they are not about to go fight this bird. They'll look away, which is pointing the beak away, which is the primary weapon, right? They'll, they'll point the beak away. They'll say, I'm not interested in fighting you. They'll tuck their bill into their feathers and hide it and they'll turn and they'll scratch and they'll do all these actions that are saying, I'm not going to attack you. I'm just, I want to get close to you and I'm doing all these weird other things, right? Um, I wanted to show this photo of the two grebes rushing, which I think you all saw on the pamphlet. Um, this is, an, this is one of also one of my favorite displays where the two grebes will keep each other in their sight. You can see they're both looking at each other because their eyes are on the side of their heads and they're keeping time with each other as they rush across the surface of the water, um, often for several meters as they go along. And finally, after we have all this courtship uh, behavior, all, all, all these things we talked about, we get bonding. And these are when two birds are establishing rapport. They're establishing that they're gonna be mated together. And obviously this doesn't happen in all birds, but generally the longer lived they are, and the more, the more permanence they have. So they will give each other gifts and attention. And, and gifts is interesting because generally, especially in seabirds, it will be a fish or it'll be a piece of food in most birds. And it's saying, I can provide for you. And, and especially in the case of the male, which usually bring the gifts, he, he'll, he'll go to the female and he'll bring her a caterpillar or fish. And that's kind of saying, I can provide for you and I can provide for a future nest, right? And the female accepting that is kind of saying yes to being with him and building a nest together. Um, in this case here, which I'm showing of waved albatrosses and longer lived birds, the bond permanence tends to be higher. Albatrosses are kind of an extreme example of monogamy because if, if they don't work, which is almost only ever because they're not fertile together, then they will break up and, you know, and scientists will call this a divorce and they'll go in search of another partner. But especially in the case of albatrosses, where the courtship is so long, where it has to take at least a year and can be more than three years of active courtship, this costs so much that they'll, they'll often get sick um, and sometimes they will die because of that. Um, 
And, you know, we do notice, because we notice birds, you know, uh, uh, reproducing every year and their courtship and their displays every year, we are reminded of the spring, right? We are, we've seen this repetition of courtship with birds that ostensibly are the same as last year's. This is not always true, but this appears to us in this way, right? We see the same sparrows, the same song, even though they already had a nest last year and they're gonna have a new nest this year. Why, why repeat that, right? That seems so romantic. Um, and that, that is very moving to us. Um, and, you know, partners will attune to each other. There has been an interesting study released last year, actually in 2020, they did a very interesting study on zebra finches where male zebra finches will exhibit in the front part of their brains a increased activity uh, right before a female will call. So they can predict when, when their mated female is about to talk. And this seems amazing, but we can prove that they're actually doing this by looking at the female and kind of detecting when she's about to say something. Um, and also by the pattern of her calls, kind of in the same way that if you're sitting at the dinner table with people, right, and you want to say something, but you're going to wait politely for somebody else to finish what they're saying, you will watch as they are talking and you will see the perfect window for in which you want to say something, right? And this happens especially between mated birds. And I wanted to show this, this, these cases of billing, which is something that happens during courtship a lot in different birds, which, which is very interesting because the beak, you know, it's the primary weapon. And yet after bonding, after tuning, they can touch their beaks together as a, as a sign of trust, as you can see in these puffins and in these gannets. Um, and yeah, I, I just wanted, I love this photo so much. So I wanted to show this in the ravens as well, where they are billing. Um, and so, I just wanted to say that in my own life, I have seen many cases of birds, uh, you know, showing affection for each other. And, and you can see these are three pages where I have drawn uh, in my field notebooks, where I have drawn birds that are courting and or that are showing affection and care for each other. And these are, of course, these are moving to me as an ornithologist, but these are moving to anybody that sees them and is reminded of themselves. And you can see in the rightmost page where these two ravens appear to be holding feet. Who knows what a raven feels when they hold feet with another raven? It probably feels scaly and cold. But we see these things and we are, we are reminded of ourselves, right? We see swans courting every year and we are all reminded of ourselves. But swans have been courting for many millions of years more than humans have been a thing. And that is amazing to me. So briefly, I wanted to say uh, we have we have this proof that we've been noticing birds for a long time with uh, this writing from Chaucer, Geoffrey Chaucer, who you will know uh, from the Canterbury Tales. And he wrote in the Parliament of Fowls, for this was on St. Valentine's Day, when every fowl cometh there to choose his make of every kind that men think may, and that's so huge a noise can they make that earth and air and tree and every lake so full was that there was hardly space for me to stand. So full was all the fowls. So even before 1400, when Chaucer was writing, people had decided that St. Valentine's Day was the day on which birds got together and decided who they would love. And so this was a marker for us to say, look at the birds. They have come out today and they have decided they're going to love each other let us also choose our own loves. And that is how St. Valentine's Day, as far as we know, became a thing. And it was actually known as the bird's wedding day um, in many places in England. And it's because of this, this romance that we see, where we see ourselves reflected in birds, that birds have, have become a part of us in literature, in our music, in our language, in our art. And they have become auspices to explain things we cannot or would rather not, such as the stork, explain a new birth in the family, or the raven, explain why we feel weird about a, a death that we feel that might come or a death that did happen, right? And so, you know, I, I want to conclude this talk by saying, I think that it is miraculous, but not surprising that birds have had this, this incredible effect on us in everything we do, even our personal lives like romance, because we see ourselves in them. And I wanted, and that's why I wanted to celebrate that in this talk, uh, as well as, as the beauty of sexual selection and, and the perfection of that theory. 
Um, and I hope you all have, have uh, come away knowing a little bit more about uh, natural selection, sexual selection, and the role of birds and, and how we think as well. So thank you very much. Um, I'm about to go in and look at the questions. What time is it? Okay, 6.33, awesome. Let's, let's check on the chat. Okay, let's see. Let me see who, who was the first question here. Um, oh, George, you were asking what, 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 what does it cause death? What were you asking? I figured that one out. That's because you were saying that they would fight each other, but now oh, yeah. that they have how swole each one is, then they know not to, not to fight the guys that are too big. <laughs> right, right. Justina Martelli is asking, how long can pairs stay together? Woo, that's a good question. That obviously depends on uh, the lifespan of different birds, right? Um, but uh, albatrosses certainly stay together for over 30 years in many cases uh, because they live, they live as, as long as 60 years. And there's, there are some cases where unfortunately they have they have a rate of mortality that that uh, will sometimes deprive a partner of a mate, and then they'll have to switch mates. But I think that an average of thirty years, while I have not studied this, is probably probably a good guess between twenty five and thirty years. Um, let's see. Oh, George asks. Side note from anthropology: I have heard that polyandry, also in humans, developed in societies whose men had a high mortality rate. Oh, interesting. Sometimes it would be male siblings married together on one woman. This way, if somebody died hunting, children would still have a father. The Leverate advice from the Bible also supports this. The ancient law dictating that a married man must marry his deceased brother's wife. I wonder if it's salmon birds. That's interesting. That, that's hard to know. You know, um, we, so far as we know, and, and we don't know that much about fowler ropes and other birds that practice polyandry. Um, males don't necessarily have a higher mortality rate than females do. So that's a, that's a pretty interesting question. Um, is there just any distinction between them, like between the, the polygonous and polyandrous birds? Yes, so the females will be the colorful ones generally, um, except in the weird case of the cardinal, right? Um, but in phalaropes, it'll be the female that has all the colors that you would, you, you know, if you've only ever seen uh, polygenous birds, monogamous birds, you'd look at that and you'd say, well, this bird is a male, but it's actually a female and the male is drab and he's the one who sits on the nest. So we're not exactly certain why, why this happened, but it may have to do with the fact that mate choice can have a runaway effect. That is to say something that seems arbitrary, such as uh, a female deciding that the male should be drabber or that the male or the male deciding the female should look more colorful can have a long-term effect in, in how the species looks like. Um, so I think that 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 does answer for a lot of interesting that we things that we see um, in animals and in birds in particular. Uh, Lewis is asking, this brings to mind the question of self-awareness, which is often seen as a mostly human trait. How do sparrows know, right? How do sparrows know how big their own black breast patch is? Right, that's a very good question. Um, and I, I'm certain there's gotta be a study on that somewhere, um, but I'm not certain that they do know how big their own patch is. I know that they, you know, based on the evidence that we have, they are able to size up somebody else. And, uh, you know, I think that Correlation is probably important here. The fact that the black breast patch is correlated to stamina and fitness mm -hmm. um, means that a bird looking at another male bird and seeing how large they are and their black breast patch is mostly, you know, he's, he is sizing up the breast patch, but what he's most importantly sizing up is the stamina. And he knows, you know, he knows himself, right? And he is looking at this bird and saying, can I take this guy on or not, right? So the black breast patch is kind of a, is sort of a, a side effect that makes things easier. Yeah. It's a, it's a signifier, but he doesn't, he, he cannot have awareness of his own, of what he's signifying 
but he must right. have an awareness of what corresponds to that. Right, right. He can he can only measure he can only measure uh, his own awareness of how how much of a chance he stands against that other bird, right? Mm. Um, and that other bird's patch and what that means for him, right? Are there any more questions? No. Okay. Well, thank you all for coming. Um, I hope you all enjoy the talk. It's one of my very favorite topics. Um, and uh, there's going to be another talk next month. We we have to decide what what date exactly, but there will be an email going out with the date and the topic. Um, you know, this teens program, we're going to cover a lot of things in general bird biology. So there's, there's, there can be a wide range of things to talk about from birds as auspices in our lives, you know, what they signify to us or, you know, bird anatomy. There's going to be a lot of stuff covered. Um, and so I opportunities for others to, for some of the people that are attending to also, um, participate in or, and present. Yes. Yes, absolutely. So the, the, I'm, I'm, you know, we're making this team program so that teen birders can get to know each other and talk about birds. And I also want other teens to be able to uh, participate and present as we go along. So I look forward to, to seeing you all, I hope. Uh, and you, you all will be getting, getting emails about what the next events will be. So thank you so much. That was great, Angelina. Thank you so much, it was really great. Thank you too. Thank you. Really Glad you enjoyed it. Thank you. Okay, we'll get to actually bird with you guys in real life. Yes. <laughs> That'd be awesome. Pasadena Audubon is awesome. Birding's awesome as well. All right. With this, I conclude this meeting. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks for coming, everybody. Bye. Bye.